crazy white shadow. What's up with your watch? Just want to turn the flashlight on. Somebody up here said yes. Look at that. Mm -hmm. What was that? Did you see something in the left corner? Yeah, I did too. Please tell me you just heard that. Yeah, absolutely. With Maryland being one of the oldest places in the United States and the seventh of the original 13 colonies, it's no surprise to find that the Old Bay is filled with stories of ghosts, haunted homes, and tales of colonial spirits lingering on nearly every square inch of the state. Its history can be traced back nearly 400 years and has been home to many pivotal moments that have defined our history as a country. We often find ourselves in search of locations close to home, hoping to share glimpses of the rich history that surrounds us in the Old Line State. This investigation takes us to the small waterfront town of Oxford, to the home of the man who essentially funded the revolution that propelled the sovereign nation into what we know today as the United States of America. The Robert Morris Inn has existed here since 1710 and is considered to be one of, if not the, oldest full-service inns in the country. This beautiful three-story colonial estate initially began as a two-bedroom cottage located on the waterfront of Oxford. And within the century, it earned its reputation as one of the finest full-service inns on the Eastern Shore. In order to understand why this location became the Robert Morris Inn, let's look back at the legacy of the Morris family and why their role in early America was crucial to the establishment of our nation. Robert Morris Sr., born in Liverpool, Lancashire, England on April 19, 1711, set sail for the newfound colony known as Maryland around 1734 to begin his new life. He left his life as an ironsmith behind in search of prosperity in the New World, and quickly found success as a merchant and a shipping agent, sealing his name in Maryland's history as a charismatic and progressive man who left an indelible mark on the town of Oxford. While the inn itself is named after Robert Morris, it's important to note that it was named after Robert Morris Jr.'s father, Robert Morris Sr., and not the financier of the revolution. Robert Morris Jr.'s story in America doesn't begin until 1748, when he left his home of Liverpool, England, at the age of 14, to join his father in the new colony. Robert Morris Sr. was the father of seven boys and three girls, and it's believed that Robert Morris Jr. was born out of wedlock in 1734, the same year Robert Morris Sr. set sail for America. One could speculate that his venture to the new colony was a result of fleeing his home to escape persecution from the church. Robert Morris Jr. was raised by his grandmother until his immigration to live with his father, and at the young age of 14, he became a successful partner with a shipping firm in Philadelphia, where he would soon relocate after his arrival. Just two years after Robert Morris Jr. arrived in America, Robert Morris Sr. passed away after an accident during a welcoming ceremony. On July 6, 1750, Morris Sr. boarded the Cunliffe ship to welcome Captain Samuel Matthews and congratulate him on completing a successful voyage. The ship's guns were to be fired in Morris Sr.'s honor as he returned to the shore, but something went wrong. For reasons still unknown, instead of waiting until the boat was well clear, Captain Matthews gave the signal to fire while it was still alongside the boat occupied by Robert and only about 20 yards away. The cannon fired, and wadding from the guns whizzed out over the water. One piece of wadding struck Morris Sr. in the right arm, smashing the bone above the elbow and causing an ugly wound. Some accounts state that the captain was swatting a fly off of his nose, and the crew mistook the gesture as a signal to fire. Still, Robert Morris Sr. died on July 12th due to complications from blood poisoning as a result of his injury, having just turned 39 years old three months prior. After his passing, Robert Morris Jr. inherited a substantial amount of wealth from his father, further accelerating his success on top of his own ventures as a shipping firm partner, and eventually putting him in one of the most powerful positions in early American government. 
His business acumen and wealth positioned him as a crucial player in the revolutionary cause when tensions between the colonies and Britain escalated. As a member of the Continental Congress, Morse was a fervent advocate for independence and a signer of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. His role was not limited to political advocacy. He was deeply involved in the logistics of the war effort, using his personal credit to procure supplies and fund the Continental Army when government resources were scarce. In 1781, Recognizing the desperate need for effective financial management, the Continental Congress appointed Morris as the Superintendent of Finance. In his capacity, he introduced several pivotal reforms to stabilize the economy of the fledging nation. One of his most significant achievements was the establishment of the Bank of North America, the first commercial bank in the United States. This institution was critical in managing war debt, issuing currency, and providing loans to support both the military and economic activities. Morris's financial strategies and reforms laid the foundation for the nation's economic policies and helped guide the United States through its early, turbulent years. Despite his early successes, Morris's later life was fraught with financial difficulties. His speculative ventures into Western lands, aimed at further boosting the nation's economy, ultimately led to his downfall. Overextended and unable to meet his obligations, Morris was imprisoned for debt in 1798 a stark contrast to his earlier status as the nation's financial savior. He spent three years in debtor's prison before being released in 1801. The final years of his life were spent in relative obscurity and financial distress until his death in 1806. Nevertheless, Robert Morris's contribution to the American Revolution and the establishment of the United States' financial system remain monumental, underscoring his legacy as a foundational figure in American history. When the property itself was purchased and converted into a full-service inn around 1800, it was promptly coined the Robert Morris Inn, in honor of Robert Morris Sr. and his impactful legacy left on the town of Oxford and the newfound Americas. It's said that even George Washington had spent some time at the inn during the Revolutionary War, using the location as a secret meeting place where political powers would discuss plans for winning the war. In tonight's investigation, we attempt to make contact with the Morris family and any other resident spirits still lingering within, hoping to validate the claims staff and owners have made over the years. Is Robert Morris Sr. and his family still here? Or are we dealing with someone or something else entirely? Oh, wow. That one's going up to yellow, that one's steady green. I've, I've seen this one go up to purple. Already? Yeah. Dude. Oh, blue. And I'm getting chills like crazy all of a sudden. The room is, it feels charged. Oh. Look at that. Look at that. It's yellow. going That's green and yellow. That's the first time that one's been to yellow, right? I think so, yeah. yeah. We really appreciate this. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Haven't even had a chance to sit down and introduce ourselves. Yeah. All right. Well, you figured out how that works. I guess I really don't have to explain it to you that none of this equipment will hurt you because you have seemed to figure that out for yourself. Can you do me a favor, if that's you touching that, can you step away from it for just a second and make it stop? We would just like to confirm that whoever's here doing that is the one doing that. Green, yellow on that one, yellow, blue. Can you make both of them light up green and yellow at the same time? Just gotta get really close to both of them. There's yellow. Oh, there's green and yellow on that one. Uh-huh. Jeez. I don't even know what to say right now. I don't either. This one's doing yellow, blue, that one's doing yeah, green, yellow. Yeah. I'm not used to seeing this much REM pod action. It's been a while. Uh, yeah, and we haven't. So we, 
You didn't even introduce ourselves. No. Well, my name is Mike. Yep. I'm David. It's nice to meet you. Yeah. It's nice to meet you. Yeah. It's nice to meet you. Yeah. Very nice meeting you. We were invited out here by the owners to come out and speak with whoever's here tonight. And from the moment we walked into the front door, we could tell that there were definitely people still here. Is this your first time engaging with somebody like this? Could you make this one light up blue? If this is the first time you've ever spoken to somebody like this? Nice. Wow, look at that. Yeah. That's great. Well, we're happy to talk to you. And we're going to be here all night and we just want to hear your story. You know, about, a little bit about the history of this place and you. And you're really enjoying these REM pods, huh? That's wild, man. We might actually have to turn them off. I was gonna say, we might have to, yeah. Is yours dying? You shouldn't. I could definitely put a new battery in it, double check, but. I know it usually does that three yeah. in the middle when it's dying. Yeah. Can I try? Put a refresh on it? Let me try and reset it. Where does I reset that one? That one's... Oh. I'm still familiarizing myself with the history of this place, but from my understanding and what little bit of information I did gather, some of the founding fathers of our country spent some time here. Is that true? So we can get some answers to the questions we ask. Can you touch that REM pod for yes and step away from it and leave it off for no? Just like that. If you understand me right now and you can hear my voice, can you make that one on the bed light up to yellow? And this one too. Yeah. You're doing great. Awesome, Thank you so man. much. You. I'm going to turn this off for now. I know you're having a lot of fun with it. It's a really fun device to play with. And you're free to use the one on the bed as well. You can use that as a way to say yes or no to us. You can leave it off for now or make it light up for yes. Are you from Oxford area? Instantly. And I got this weird feeling in my knee. Yeah. Right as that went off, it felt like somebody kind of came up and grabbed my knee. Did you used to live in this house? Could you use this device to tell us what year you lived here? You said Bride Steel. Hmm. I said, like, that could be something. Are we speaking to a man? Are we speaking to a woman? Through that device that Mike has in his hand, you can also go through it and you can say names. Could you tell us your name? You could also go near one of the cameras. They have microphones on them, and if you get close enough and put enough energy into it, we'll be able to hear you when we go back and review later. Said unequal react. Uh, at that time, women would have been very unequal to men for the time period. 
here. I don't know if that's what it's referring to, but it very well could be. Oh, did your light just adjust, or did I just see something? No, I saw that too. Okay, I I couldn't tell if it was like the light. I didn't, yeah. Cowardly, prejudiced, avoid ledge windows. Really need to do some research on the history. Did you pass away in this building? Something outside. Was it? Okay. Yeah. Is there anyone else here with you? crazy chills up my legs. Maybe they're not here with you specifically, but maybe they lived in this house at one point or close by. Are there more than one of you is what I'm trying to ask. Was this your room? That explains why. Oh, I lost. Yeah. Well, I'm that and the activity. Here. Yeah. Because uh, Gretchen said this and downstairs, second floor. Yeah. The two most active rooms, so. I remember when we first walked into this place, as soon as I opened the front door, I saw a shadow dart from the check-in lobby all the way through the kitchen. And I knew that it was gonna be a good night. We spent a bit of time getting acquainted with the property itself. And once everybody left, we decided that we were gonna start from the top floor where most of the activity is reported and work our way down. Equipment going off before we're even ready to start has been a very common theme with us for the last year. I don't know. It just seems like everywhere we go, before we're ready to even begin shooting the investigation, they're ready to talk to us. I knew we were going to get something, but I did not expect this. I mean, the REM pods were going off constantly, to the point to where I turned them off because they would have just gone the entire time that we were in this room. It was great to see them so eager and ready to interact with us and share their story with us. It's really great. Not many people have got to come and experience this the way we have. It's a really beautiful place. Not just the location around it, but the building itself is really beautiful. Yeah, I could see why you wanted to stay here. Were you married when you lived here? Instantly. Instant. It's been quiet. Mm -hmm. Do you have children? Are they here with you as well? Okay. Well, we've got our answer to more than one. Yeah. So we've got a mother. Mother and children. Mother and children, for sure. Is it more than one child? Oh, wow. Yes. Yes, it is. is I can it, imagine. Okay. Is it two children? Three, four. If they were back then, they would have had a lot of children. Is it more than five? Did you end up having more than five children? Damn. Damn. You must have a very happy husband. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Is it less than 10? Okay. So more than five, less than 10. Big family. Yep. Is there any other family members here other than you and your children? 
Is your husband here? Thurifer? And avoidable. I don't know what that word means. I don't either. Thurifer. I kind of want to look it up. An acolyte carrying a censer. Container in which incense is burned, typically during a religious ceremony. Cause, so could that have been something done at a marriage ceremony? It's, or Well, it said thoroughfare and then avoidable or avoided. Uh, so avoided, avoided the, the ceremony? There, avoided the ceremony. Is that a runaway bride? Are you a runaway bride? Were you a... Uh, oh. oh? So, let me guess. Your father... Or your parents arranged a marriage for a man that you didn't want to marry. And instead of complying, you decided to rebel. And one thing led to another, and then you eventually settled here. Yeah, bang. <laughs> Anorexia sneered. I feel like we're getting a lot of things that would have referred to women back back in that time period. Yeah. You agree with that? Yeah. Is there uh, any messages that you want to get out to anyone or okay. feel free to tell us at any point. You can use that device like you've been using in Mike's hand now or you can go to the cameras like we mentioned earlier. We can try piecing together your story as well. Yeah, we'll do our best to try and figure things out just based on the clues that you give us. We just ask that you be a little patient with us as we try to figure out the details. We might miss things or misinterpret what you say, but with enough time and patience, I think we'll figure something out and be able to understand why you're here. So, the person that we're speaking to right now, were you, were you a runaway bride? Between capturer, expendable, slave. 17, 10. Definitely would have had slavery. Oh, for yeah. sure. It's, this would probably would have been a place. Yep. Do you know what year it is currently? I just heard a yep. Yeah. Pretty clear. Woman, yep. Hmm. Like a raspy woman's voice. Scare, mourn, freak, chaining. Morning, like as in morning, or like a.m.? No, morn. Morn, like yeah. morn. Are we speaking with the missus still? Ma'am, are you here? Can you touch that again if you are? Are any of the children here? So well, thanks. Thanks for coming to talk with us. Are we speaking to one of the children right now? Is that why you're so eager to touch these lights? Okay. There's two rooms downstairs that have mirrors facing each other. I was wondering if you know anything about that, if there's anything downstairs that we should try to look into. Perhaps there's a way for other energies to come in and out of this space freely. Is 
if there is, could you please light that up just to confirm? Right now it's just a suspicion between the two of us, but we would really appreciate it if you could confirm it for us. Are there portals on the second floor? Well, we're going to move down the stairs to the second floor and try and talk to whoever's there. You're more than welcome to join us. We'd love to have you down there. Maybe you can show them how this equipment works. Absolutely. We try not to look into the history of locations that we go to just because we want to remove any bias or any preconceived notions when it comes to the evidence that we find. So other than light research, we don't really look into these places that much. Just based on the responses we were getting in this moment, I felt like we were talking to Elizabeth Murphitt, which is Robert Morris Jr.'s mother. Elizabeth Murphitt and Robert Morris Sr. had 10 children. And I didn't know this until after I started doing the research on this video. We know that Robert Moore Sr. passed away in the home after sustaining an injury from a welcoming ceremony, but we couldn't get a definitive answer if he was there or not. In the beginning of the video, I did mention that Robert Morris Sr. came to America in 1734, right after Robert Morris Jr. was born. And this could have been due to the fact that Robert Morris Jr. was born out of wedlock. Back in that time period, the church was essentially the law. And if you didn't follow the law, you would be persecuted by the church. Seeing responses like thoroughfare and avoidable and doing a little bit of research on what a thoroughfare is, just to me, it feels like it's confirming the suspicions that I have about Robert Morris Sr. fleeing to America after Robert Morris Jr. was born. A huge reason why America was founded in the first place was to separate autonomy in the church and allow people to make decisions for themselves and not based on the Christian ideology that Great Britain had built itself upon for so many centuries. If you couple this with the runaway bride theory that we had in the video, it makes sense why Robert Morris Sr. would flee to America to escape persecution of the church. Back then, having children out of wedlock carried serious consequences, so I could see why he would want to escape from that. There's a possibility that Elizabeth and Robert Morris Sr. had an affair, and they were caught, and that's why he ended up here. But we weren't able to actually confirm this in real time, so this is just a theory. Once activity slowed down on the third floor, we moved to the second floor where we were picking up a lot of activity before we actually set up. We were seeing, hearing, and feeling all kinds of stuff around us. And there was also a room towards the end of the hall that had two mirrors facing each other, which gave us the theory that there could possibly be a portal here. That was weird the way it said it. Dude, I, I've noticed there's a few words like Miss Lady. Oh. I just saw a crazy white shadow. What's up with your watch? Just went to turn the flashlight on. By itself? Right. You, I yeah, know. well, I mean, I saw it. Right? Whoa. I just saw a crazy white shadow. Oh. I just saw a crazy white shadow. And you, in order to change that, you have to turn this dial. I didn't see you reach or touch that at all. Oh, not at all. Huh. I haven't used, like, haven't used the flashlight. You have to go into this screen, scroll. Wow. Well, you were saying you wanted to see if anything would happen with that yeah. out in the field. <laughs> you got your wish. Yeah, there we go. I love getting new pieces of equipment. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> well, we moved downstairs to the second floor. And once again, before we've had a chance to set up, you're already making devices go off, making yourself known. We really appreciate it. Seem to really like this music box down the hall. Can you play it again? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You really like music, don't you? Did you hear that? It was like a... No, it's somebody in here said yes.
Oh, I heard like, like a super right clear. Here. Wow. Upstairs, we were getting a lot of activity on these red lights. And so we set up two in front of these mirrors that we have a suspicion about. Uh, if there is anyone in here, could you come over and touch one of these red lights? You were playing with them a lot earlier. I don't know if we're speaking with someone else. I don't know if you were upstairs with us having the conversation up there. But if you weren't, and this is your first time meeting us, just want to let you know that none of this stuff will hurt you. It's just like the music box down the hall. Some light up, some make noise, some do both. But they're all just means of communication to be able to speak with you and know that you're here. We've also set out a bunch of different lights in front of each room in this hallway. Could you light up one of the toys in front of the door to let us know which room was yours? I heard a lot of noises coming back from this room behind us. So I put a little ball on the table there as well, or on the edge of the bed. Can you make one of those go off? I thought we heard like a weird like grunt sound coming out of there earlier. There is a device here on this edge of the table too. If you want, you could go there and you could pick any word you want. Maybe even tell us what room number you're in. I was thinking about this earlier because of how old this place is. I was wondering, was this building used as a field hospital at any point dur during the War of 1812? You could set off that music box down the hallway as a way to say yes to us, or leave it off for no. Earlier we were talking with some children. Are any of them down here with us? I saw it out of the corner yeah. of my eye again. Yep, oh, yeah. there it is. It's nice, nice to meet you. you. Yeah, it's very nice to meet you. <laughs> Are you one of the children that we were to speaking to upstairs? Do you like all these different toys we brought for you? <laughs> Instant music box. Yeah. That's good. Glad to hear that. Is there anything that happened here that you can tell us about that maybe history might have forgotten? Oh yeah, I saw that. Hmm. Wow. As David mentioned upstairs, you can come up to one of these devices and say whatever you like into it. When we go home later, we'll be able to hear you. Have you had a chance to talk to the new owners here yet? Well, we know the children are down here. Are all of you down here?
Based on what we were picking up when we initially got here, it seemed like most of you were hanging out on the second floor. Is this where most of you spend your time? Yep, saw that. There's two rooms in the entire inn that have mirrors facing each other. One more time just to confirm, are these access points? Maybe not for you specifically, but for other energies. Can other energies, other beings come into this building as a result of those mirrors facing each other? You can either touch the K2 or make the music box go off as a way to say yes. I'm not sure how significant this building is to Robert Morris, but considering it's named after him, I'm sure he spent quite a bit of time here. Is he still here? If so, can you touch one of these to go off? Yeah. Now, as you can see, all of the activity changes once we move to the second floor. We're no longer getting REM pod responses, but the music box seems to be going crazy the whole time that we're down there. I didn't see it in the moment, but the EDI did light up when I asked about Robert Morris still being present on the property. Now, I wasn't able to confirm if this was Robert Morris Jr. or Sr., but one of them was still there. Even though this floor was the most active when we initially got there, things started to slow down a little bit, and we had one last stop to take before we finished this investigation for the night. So we head downstairs to the bar and dining area to see what we could find down there. Good evening, everyone. Sorry, it took us a little while to get set up, but we're here now. In case there's anyone new down here that didn't get a chance to speak with us yet, my name is Mike. I'm David. We've just come to spend the evening with you, chat with you a bit, learn some history about this place. Hopefully get to interact with you. Been seeing you all over the room. Yeah, absolutely. Everywhere. So we decided to turn all the lights off. Hopefully that makes you more comfortable, makes you more inclined to want to interact with us. Please don't be afraid of any of the lights that you see or any of the equipment that you see in our hands. None of this stuff will hurt you in any way. It's a way for us to communicate with you. We're very eager to learn about you and learn about this place. Oh, that scared me. <laughs> I said Europe. Are you from Europe? If so, could you touch one of the lights that we've laid out for you? There's a couple of red lights here you can touch. They make noise and light up. David has a light in his hand you can touch. There's also small round lights that you can touch on the bar and on various cups. If you make any one of these lights go off, you can use that as a way to say yes to us if we ask you questions. Or you can leave them off for no. Could you do me a favor and please touch one of the lights in the room just so that way we know you understand us and can hear us? All you have to do is put a little energy into it and it'll light up. There's also a few devices over at the bar. A few cat balls over there as well, so if you want to go up there for a drink, you can go over there and set one of those devices off. What part of Europe are you from? Could you tell us through that device?
You may be talking about it being a European dinner menu. I saw that on a paper over next door. Now for a majority of this portion, nothing was really happening. We weren't getting any device responses and we weren't really hearing anything. However, from a personal experience, we were seeing and feeling a lot in the room around us. And something that caught my eye during review was this anomaly that appears on camera in the bottom left corner. Now in almost every instance when I capture something like this, I almost immediately write it off as dust. Now I watched all three angles very closely to see if anything like this appeared anywhere else in the room, and this is the only instance where we caught something like this. Now while you may be thinking to yourself that's just dust, pay attention to what I say after this appears on screen. Did you see something in the left corner? Yeah. I did too. And surprisingly, this isn't the only time that this happens. It actually appears several more times throughout this portion, but this is the only instance where we thought we actually saw something the moment that it appears on camera. I saw someone in the right corner. Somebody's talking. Someone's in the kitchen. Turn your head the opposite way and, and listen with one ear. I'm listening to it this way. Just moments after I asked David if he saw what I saw in the left-hand corner of the room, the anomaly appears again, and it moves in the same direction at the same speed. Could this be somebody coming in to sit down for a drink, or possibly a former resident of the home? We don't know. It was really exciting to find out that I captured something like this on camera. Not that yeah, that was not the ice machine. No. Is there someone in the kitchen? Could you maybe make a noise in there again? Has that always been a kitchen? Maybe it was something else. Maybe it's something else entirely to you. An office, a den. You spend a lot of time in there? Did they come from behind me? What? Please tell me you just heard that. Yeah, absolutely. That's so loud. Inept, really wary, pervasive think. Are you wary of our presence here? You don't have to be. We come with the best intention. 
just want to talk to you, learn a little bit about you. If there's anyone here with you, we would like to learn about them as well. I would say that this was definitely the most tame portion of our entire investigation, aside from the noises that we were hearing in the kitchen. Obviously we can't film in there, there's a lot of loud fans and compressors going off, so the audio would have been completely ruined. However, you can hear in the distance a lot of banging, knocks, footsteps, and other kinds of physical noises going on around us. We spent the rest of our night down here trying to make contact with somebody. Still, nonetheless, I think we captured a lot of consistent evidence throughout this video that hopefully confirms some suspicions or experiences that other staff members have had while working here. There was something else I wanted to mention too that I actually didn't find out until after this video. While I was doing my research on this place, I came across some information that indicates that this wasn't actually used as an inn for the entirety of its existence. It had actually been repurposed several times over the course of a couple hundred years and it was used as the official town hall, it was used as a convalescent home for World War I soldiers, and it was also a general store before it was repurposed back into an inn in sometime around the 1940s. I wasn't sure what a convalescent home was, so I looked that up, and it turns out that it's essentially like an inpatient rehab or an inpatient facility for people to recover from wounds, and a lot of the people that spent time here and were seeking treatment never left. I don't know where this nagging feeling of asking about a field hospital came from while I was there, but it just kind of hit me, and I really wanted to get to the bottom of that question and see if it was in fact used as a field hospital. Keep in mind I don't do a lot of research on these places when I initially go to them because, again, I want to remove inherent bias, and I want to see what I find and see if the evidence that I find correlates with actual historical records. To learn that this was used as a convalescent home at one point was very validating for me because it was just something that kept nagging at me. I don't know why I got the feeling to ask this question, but I could feel like there was a lot of unnecessary suffering in this building at one point, and I couldn't pinpoint why or how, but while they didn't answer us directly if this place was used as a field hospital, digging into research later and finding out that it was a convalescent home was extremely validating for me. I really enjoyed investigating the Robert Morris Inn. It was an honor to be able to walk through such a historic location, especially a place that has been standing since before America became America. I don't doubt that there are spirits still lingering there. Just based on what we were able to gather, it seems like the entire Morris family is still present within the home. And I could see why. This was their first home that they settled in when they arrived in America. And I could see that being something that they hold very close to them, so. It makes sense as to why they're still there. At some point, I would like to return to this place and talk to the soldiers that resided there when it was a convalescent home, because I didn't know that. I know that when we were there initially, a few of the staff members seemed a little on edge to find out if there was anything still there. So I hope that they watch this and realize that nothing there is going to hurt them. They are very friendly, and they are willing to interact with people if the people wanting to interact with them approach it respectfully. This was a wonderful piece of early American history that I got to investigate with David, and I'm really excited that I got to share it with you all, and I hope that we get to go back eventually and see if we can find more. <laughs>